Yeah. Uh, so um, we've got a project that's just starting up this year, and it is the uh, frog project, frog and fish. And we've uh, really brought those all together because they, they interact and they're, they're facing some of the, many of the same problems. And I want to uh, mostly introduce the, the sort of problems we're trying to solve and a little bit about what we're doing and hopefully uh, attract your interest. And I think there's a sign-up sheet that Dennis Caldwell put out back uh, and maybe you can get us some information about uh, about how to do the outreach, which is a, a very complicated and, and critical part of this project. So we've got a website that Dennis is the master of, and I uh, want to note that uh, a number of people have been absolutely instrumental in getting this, Jeff Sims and Karen Sims, and Gita Bodner especially, uh, made this uh, project go from the very beginning. And this is uh, us, and I guess you don't know David Hall, but he's a key uh, person in this, in this project, and uh, he's been out in the field all over the place uh, gathering some of the information that I'll talk about today, but mostly uh, just introduce the, the project and the, the issues. So this is our, our work area. It's primarily the upper basin of Sienega Creek, which uh, we define it from the narrows up to the headwaters, but we go from crest to crest and up into this, the uh, Canelo Hills, and we're looking forward to, uh, to working with uh, the, the research ranch. And we've got uh, a, a sort of a broader concern because of the, uh, the nature of the problems we're facing and the ways we want to solve them that uh, in, in addition to uh, sort of doing the usual, our usual stuff, survey and research and monitoring, uh, we, we know that we're going to need to work with uh, local, the local residents. And this is a growing community, and they're going to have growing effects on, on this ecosystem, or potentially they will. Uh, and we hope that these are good effects, but you'll see that there are some serious threats. And uh, because of the, the, the nature of those threats and the way we want to solve them, We've uh, expanded our focus also to include the, the lower part of the stream. There's perennial stream, and I'll show you down here towards Vale, and also into Tucson because of the, uh, the, uh, the way we want to solve the exotic species problem. Uh, so this is a, a kind of example of, of what's happened in the area, and you've heard about this before. There were perennial reaches uh, in Lower Sienega Creek, and down by Fort Lowell, up in uh, a couple of mountain canyons in Agua Caliente and Tanca Verde, and at the confluence of the Rito on the Santa Cruz, and the major one that brought people in here uh, thousands of years ago, and then brought Europeans in hundreds of years ago, uh, right at Tucson in the Santa Cruz. And you'll, of course, know that pretty much all of that is gone, the perennial water's gone, except for in the county preserve north of I-10, and in our focal area here in the upper basin. Uh, this is Tucson about 100 years ago. Uh, it's already started to degrade, but you can see that looking across from A Mountain Sentinel Peak to downtown Tucson and University of Arizona, uh, this was so productive that it was recovering already from its first wave of, of human effect. So Sienega Creek is indeed uh, a window into the past and uh, we hope in some areas of the future. Uh, why is it so good? Well, uh, this is because I'm at the research ranch. I thought I'd run some of this stuff by you guys in case you're not Sienega Creek people. And it's got uh, you know, deep pools and mesquite bosques and big sacatone meadows. You've got sacatone here, I know, but uh, and it's got uh, uh, sort of floodplain ponds like this and, and a, a, a wonderful Sienega flora, which, which probably doesn't exist in very many places at all. Uh, however, there are other uh, Sienegas in southeastern Arizona that have all of that, but uh, they, they, they lack the, the animals that um, we're going to focus on. And I wanted to kind of make the point that these animals are extremely endangered. This whole aquatic vertebrate fauna of the American Southwest is highly endangered, especially in the United States. 
and it appears that the same is going to be happening with approximately a four decade lag in northwestern Mexico. So uh, this is, uh, I think, on a global scale, one of the most endangered uh, faunas. These are the, our focal species for this project, and all of them are in Cienega Creek. As Jeff mentioned, there are not many exotics. There are no exotic fish in the creek itself, and there's uh, just, just a bullfrog, and we're trying to keep it that way. So these are the, uh, the Mexican garter snake and Sonoran mud turtle, very abundant still. Chiricahua leopard frog lowland, and the three, the three fish. And so this is basically the only uh, lowland system in the United States that is native fish dominated. There's, there's at least one in Sonora at Saracachi. It actually has five or six species of native fish. But it's, it's really our only example. Uh, Tucson had six species of native fish at Tucson originally. But this is the closest we can come. So uh, our sort of biggest and most pressing problem is, is with this growing population, there's a, a tendency for people to want a little too much of home. And uh, you know, this was uh, Chuck Lowe's uh, thing about what people do, and it was actually, <clears throat> he applied that to Kita Bikito, was some management that was done there in his time. But in any case, uh, you know, largemouth bass, premier sport fish in North America, and uh, usually something for them to eat, bluegill sunfish. And uh, sometimes they bring in channel cats. And uh, more or less accidentally, nowadays, they bring in other exotics, the mosquito fish, northern crayfish, and bullfrog. So these things uh, pose a threat because they're up in the, the periphery of the, uh, of the stream system in stock ponds, they, they pose a threat to to the stream itself and, and the native fish. And I'll talk specifically about what kind of threat these pose. Uh, our number one fear for, from our perspective is that the mosquito fish will get loose. It's uh, very much like the top minnow to live bearer, sword tail family. It uh, is from the eastern US. You can see they're very similar fish, except the, the male top minnows are black. And you know, fish people, if you want to be a fish person, you have to be able to do this. It's like, oh, that's obviously a top minnow. And, and, and you can do that, clearly, you know. But it's, it's one of those things. And my dad was a fish person, so I, I claim that I can do it. Uh, mosquito fish almost invariably, uh, you know, if there isn't something else really stopping them, eliminate top minnows in, in, uh, within very short order. So this is an immediate threat. They're very hard to, to eradicate. They'll be extremely hard to get out of Sienega Creek, if not impossible. And they are readily available. Uh, it's, I think it's illegal now to, to get them and spread them around. But everybody has them, and they get moved accidentally or on purpose because they are thought to be sort of prime mosquito control. They are easy to handle. And uh, you, know, you don't get in as much trouble for doing that as for moving top minnows. So that sort of our crusade is to get past uh, that issue. And we, 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 did, uh, we did find, unfortunately, the first population in the basin this year, David Hall did. So uh, it's not an immediate threat to be flooded out into Cienega Creek, but it's a symptom of what we know is coming as this kind of Oklahoma farm pond operation becomes more widespread. And the tragedy of, of this is, and it's a global tragedy, is that the native fish are extremely efficient at mosquito control. They're just as good or better, generally speaking. So uh, I mentioned the bluegill as one of the sort of bad guys that are showing up in the farm pond system and in lakes, of course, and it's a, it's a great food fish. Uh, a lot of people think that's a bluegill because they've got that nice sort of sky blue, sometimes neon blue, reticulations on the jaw, it's a green sunfish. And it's quite different ecologically, even though they look pretty similar to the non-fish eye. Uh, they're, they're very different, just more streamlined. It's able to live up in Sabino Canyon, despite that, that intense flooding. And it's a, got a bigger mouth, and it eats bigger animals like fish. And tadpoles, these guys eat tadpoles also, but they're primarily insectivores. And they're really not very good at surviving in flood ecosystems. 
So maybe this isn't the biggest invasive, but what happens is, uh, oh, let's get some bluegills. Whoops. So we're very much afraid that this species would get loose and survive in the creek, and it would have an effect perhaps on, on Gila Chub and probably a serious one. Aren't kind of simple, like all exotics are better or equal or anything. Very specific problem that we're worried about, and this is one, and the bullhead catfish is another, whereas the panel cat's probably not going to live in the creek very well. Bullhead could easily take over. So we're surveying for the found green sunfish basin yet, and that's a good thing. Uh, northern crayfish has been in Arizona since the 50s, and it's been spread sort of gradually, and uh, it's amazing how they, they get over land from place, and uh, they are, 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 are pretty good at moving in five-gallon buckets. They're quite talented about that, and we've, <laughs> we've done a bunch of studies, uh, and they actually, uh, only a few studies, we've only had a few opportunities, but they have, have put a complete stop to recruitment in, in a, a, a long-term turtle, turtle study population, for example, and then we found that they completely denude uh, streams of vegetation. They basically eat the plant and the animals, and it, you know, not to exaggerate, actually. And uh, they were discovered up in a pond in the headwaters of Las Cienegas in 2006, and we've been working to remove them since then, and they're quite difficult to eradicate, even in a pond. So this is our third year trying to, and so hopefully next year we're going to take sterner measures. <laughs> yeah, we're basically, hopefully we'll get a valve in there, we can, we can drain it, and because once we do get that under control, it will be an excellent habitat for native species. But meanwhile, we're, we're, we're quite, much, quite afraid they're going to get into uh, Sienega Creek itself. So this was sort of the, the bugabear, bugabear that Cecil Schwalbe and I have been dealing with for, for well, let's see, 25, and we've had some success controlling bullfrog. Uh, I wanted to bring them into the picture as part of uh, kind of the Mexican garter snake, which has been a long-term study that we actually started here at the ranch in 1985 at Fin Tank. Uh, and so, sort of to explain the multiple ways exotic species affect uh, native species, the bullfrog sort of a good one. Uh, the, the worm has turned, Cecil like to say, uh, they eat garter snakes, even though gar uh, big garter snakes eat young bullfrogs. They eat lead frogs, so they're predators with, um, with garter snakes. And these competitors, like these green sunfish that we got out of a tank in Apache Pass, can become extremely abundant to control and, and uh, pretty much wipe out anything they eat, which certainly includes leopard frog tadpole. And bullfrogs harbor uh, disease that's an exotic disease, probably uh, heard of if you follow science news, uh, chytridiomycosis, it's a fungal disease, fungal disease, and because they serve as a reservoir without being wiped out themselves, they have yet an additional effect, and this is just sort of to, to symbolize what very often happens to leopard frog populations. When the disease gets in, they crash, and many of them go to zero. And so in this way, the bullfrog, by transmitting a disease, has an effect on the Mexican garter snake food supply. Uh, bullfrogs are especially uh, problematic because they, on their own, can cross desert grassland to at least seven miles in a matter of six weeks or so. So, uh, well, they probably have to reach water, but we don't really know that because there is pretty much water every two to three miles for cattle. Uh, you know, if it rains enough, uh, we, we don't think they turn around and go back. So, they, but yeah, probably the stepping stones are very important, and we think that's sort of the way that at Buenos Aires, where this work was done, that we can control, control them coming out. We're actually eliminating these. David Hall and, and Blaine Ribke are, are eliminating these populations with the help of Santa Margarita Ranch. Uh, but there are populations over in Aravaca on the other side over here that are, are going to be very hard to get rid of. So we're trying to create a barrier, a, a, a stepping stone free barrier. And so this is pretty impressive, but it's, it's no, just nothing like the dispersal capability of mosquito fish because uh, uh, they, they, they just they use vehicles. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a little data from the research ranch. 
And uh, originally over at Finley Tank, there was about 95 or 100 uh, adult and sub-adult Mexican garter snakes when I started. That's originally when the world began. Um, and uh, at, at that time, uh, but since that time, the population, this is the total in blue, has, has uh, collapsed to near zero. And I understand someone's followed this up in the last two or three years, and, and this has stayed this way or gotten worse. I don't have the details of that. The food source is basically non-existent, except maybe for bullfrogs, and you've probably taken care of those too. Uh, but what's happened and the, sort of the evidence for what's happened is that the, the adults sort of hung on for a while, this yellow line, but the juvenile population is what's stopped. And that suggests that it is indeed the lack of, of food, that they really don't have enough food because leopard frogs disappeared during uh, shortly after I started my research. And I didn't have anything much to do with that, I don't think. Of course, I was stomping around in the mud all over the state, so I might have moved the disease, but because of that uh, huge movement that frogs do over land, I'm kind of going to deny my role in it. But well, there weren't bullfrogs here. See, this is, this is basically what, what I'm trying to get at is that the leopard frogs declined, and we think this was the, the era during which this disease spread over southeastern Arizona. And what it appears to, to us is that we don't have test data from these ponds, but from elsewhere, that the, that the disease came through and, uh, and wiped out the leopard frogs, and reproduction stopped, and, and basically the, the number and percentage of juveniles dropped very low, and eventually that led to population collapse. So this is sort of without bullfrogs, without any, this was before the bullfrog showed up at Finley Tank. Now, we don't really know how that disease got in there, but it actually turns out, uh, I'm not gonna go way into this, but that uh, the bullfrogs showed up in this region right about 1986. I found them in Sienega Creek. That was the first time in Sienega Creek. Uh, so they may have, been the vector and, and not me. But in any case, that's sort of a, a roundabout impact, but apparently a very significant one. And we're sort of struggling with that in, in Sienega Creek where we're removing bullfrogs, where there are very few leopard frogs left, and you know the, the garter snake population is struggling. So I mean, it's, it's sort of a, it's a pincers on them. So they can't really survive very well with bullfrogs, and, and now, now there's going to be no rounded frogs. That's their dietary staple, the Mexican garter snake. And then there's a, a sort of a complicating thing that goes on in southeastern Arizona that you've got a diversity of garter snake species. The checkered garter snake, which is somewhat more terrestrial, especially when it's a juvenile, especially when it's edible size for, for, a, for a bullfrog. And the Mexican garter snake is highly aquatic pretty much throughout its life. And uh, so see, that's not showing up too well. But these are checkered garter snakes. And this is San Bernardino, where we tried for the first time to remove bullfrogs. They persisted fine throughout this whole, era, this whole uh, effort that we made uh, in spite of one of the densest known bullfrog populations in the world whereas the Mexican garter snake declined, and, and that was the last one that's been seen at San Bernardino, even though the refuge manager's uh, a herp guy. So they, they, they really did decline uh, despite our, to extinction despite our best efforts. And so I called it the change in competitive balance, but it really isn't like food competition. There's tons of food. I mean, there are bullfrogs everywhere. There's plenty of fish, but for some reason, well, for the reason that these guys don't get wiped out by bullfrogs, the, the, uh, they, they probably are in training or maintaining other population pressures on garter snakes as a whole. And because they've got an advantage, that's driving these guys down. And so that's a pretty, it's called an indirect uh, or an, an indirect uh, interaction or apparent competition competition for predator-free space, and we think that's what's going on, and we've got only a little bit of other evidence for it, but that's sort of an ongoing uh, issue in, in, uh, in this whole region because there are checkered garter snakes 
in the Sonoida grasslands and at Las Cienegas, and we have already started seeing more of them in Las Cienegas. So I think I'm going to get through it. Uh, so uh, I sort of did all that to arrive at the ranted frog, the Chiricahua leopard frog, which is sort of the, the raison d'etre of our project, was conservation of the Chiricahua leopard frog. And uh, I wanted to note that uh, ranted frogs are part of the global amphibian decline in pristine environments. The Tarahumara frog was extirpated from the United States from 1973 to 1983. And it appears that disease was the, the cause, possibly facilitated by pollution from smelters. And the Chiricahua leopard frog has survived, but its core metapopulations in the valleys, the Cienegas, where they're originally most numerous, are all but gone, with Las Cienegas being the only exception. And the cause of that, in addition to exotic predators, seems to be this, this disease. And this disease seems to have a great effect at low temperatures. Another uh, ranted frog is the lowland leopard frog present uh, in the lower half of uh, the Las Cienegas conservation area. And it's done better. It lives in warmer environments. It's done better than the Chiricahua leopard frog. But we've got various monitoring data of which the Aravipa series is the best. And BD arrived again in the area. Sometime in the early 80s, we've got actually records from the United States, from southern Arizona from 1973, going back in Chiricahua leopard frogs to the Tarahumara frog decline. And uh, it was not detected in this region, but it was detected in 85 in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Galliero Mountains elsewhere. The population crashed and has stayed pretty low, although it's persisted. So this is just sort of what's happened is that even though they persist, in some of their core populations, they persist in greatly reduced abundance. And but the interesting thing is, and this is in many, many ranted frogs in the southwest, perhaps all, that in warm springs, they, they can do very well. In fact, a, a, a colleague of mine, Martin Schlepfer, working at hot springs, saw a lowland leopard frog jump into a water that was 43C and basically sit there on the bottom for a while and then swim away. And, and that's plenty sufficient to kill the disease organism. And that population is just hundreds of frogs in a room, in a pond this size, the size of this room. In a cold spring nearby, they're, they're, they're sick and they're rare. So our approach, uh, in addition to doing the spe exotic species removals, is to try and utilize sort of the most uh, readily available and readily manageable types of habitats like ranch ponds, which can be, we, we can, how many, two? We can, we can get the exotics out of there, potentially if we can get cooperation, and backyard ponds, even easier to, uh, to manage, and we can even enclose those, and, to, and we can in some cases find uh, warm sites to use for this. Vivarium, which is a frog house. <laughs> And, uh, and what the intention is, is to, to get enough frogs to start releasing them in, in renovated habitats or created habitats on the conservation area so that we can study what happens, we can study the disease process and the, and the uh, hopefully, the uh, establishment of these animals throughout the conservation area or, or get more perspective on it. And, and eventually, we hope that uh, in, in the, the worst case that the species will become numer numerous enough to, to evolve resistance to this disease, which there is some evidence for in ranted frogs now. And I wanted to just finish up with a, sort of an overview of, of the things we're doing, Most uh, many of which I've mentioned. We're doing intensive surveys throughout the area. We're looking at the riparian herpetofauna, which is extremely rich in Cienega Creek and uh, the surrounding lowlands. And the in exotic removals are our sort of most immediate uh, critical concern. But we have a lot of work to do with outreach to agencies, and I've kind of alluded to the difficulty of doing things that we need to do, such as uh, have available uh, uh, threatened and endangered species for, uh, to replace the exotics. I mean, people need mosquito control, they need fish, they're gonna go get mosquito fish or, or some other thing if they don't have access to natives. And then public outreach, which is critical for us. 
And that's where we, uh, I hope and we hope that you guys can give us some clue as to who in this region to talk to, both to help or to get access to, to ponds or people who just want to sort of participate by helping us you know, build new ponds or renovate ponds or, or work in the Cienega. And uh, that's uh, basically what uh, we're doing. I just wanted to mention that uh, we are taking uh, the legal route, the safe harbor agreement route, and uh, we uh, hope that that's going to be what happens late this year and early uh, next year.